call your attention to Proverbs 31. Very familiar passage of scripture, just one verse in your hearing. Thankful for all of you mothers who are in the sanctuary. Bless you. Proverbs 31, verse 29, says these words. Many women have done wonderful things, but you outclass them all. Many women have done wonderful things, but you have outclassed them all. For this time, which is ours this morning, I want to tag a title for this text, When a Mother Handles Her Business. When a Mother Handles Her Business. Born Sarah Breve Love on December 23rd, 1867 in Delta, Louisiana, to Owen and Minerva Breedlove. She was one of six children. She had a sister, Luvinia, and four brothers, Alexander, James, Solomon, and Owen, Jr. Her parents and elder siblings were slaves on the Madison Parish Plantation owned by Robert W. Burning. She was the first child in her family born into freedom after the Emancipation Proclamation signing. Her mother died possibly in 1872 from some complications. Her father remarried and died shortly thereafter. She moved in with her older sister and brother-in-law, Willie Howard. At the age of 14, she married Moses McWilliams to escape Powell's abuse, and three years later, her daughter, Leela McWilliams, was born. When Sarah was 20, her husband died and Leela was just two years old. Shortly afterwards, she moved to St. Louis where three of her brothers lived. Her brothers were all barbers at a local barber shop. In 1906, she married Charles Joseph Walker, a newspaper advertising salesperson. Like many women of her era, Sarah experienced hair loss. Because most Americans lack indoor plumbing, central heating, and electricity, they bathe and wash their hair infrequently. The results are scalp disease. Sarah experimented with home remedies and products already on the market until she finally developed her own shampoo and an ointment that contains sulfur to help make her hair and her, and her scalp more healthy and her hair to grow even more. Sarah was selling her products throughout the United States, while her daughter, Leela, ran a mail order business from Denver. Sarah and her husband traveled throughout the southern and eastern states. They settled in Pittsburgh in 1908 and opened Leela College to train hair culturists. In 1910, Sarah moved to Indianapolis, Indiana, where she established her headquarters and built a factory. She began to teach and to train other women to help them build their own business. She also gave lectures on political, economic, and social issues at conventions sponsored by black powerful institutions. After the East St. Louis race riot, she joined leaders of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People in their efforts to support legislations to make lynching a federal crime. In 1918, at the biennial Convention of the National Association of Colored Women, NACW, she was acknowledged for making the largest contribution to save the Anacostia, Washington, D.C. House of abolitionist Frederick Douglass. She continued to donate money throughout her career to the NAACP, the YMCA, and black schools, organizations, individuals, individuals orphanages, and retirement homes. In 1917, she moved her she moved to her Irvington on Hudson, New York estate, Villa Lawara, which was designed by Vetner Tandy, the first licensed black architect of New York State and one of the founding members of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. The house at the time cost $250,000. And our text today is a sister who handles her business. She is being introduced to the king by the king's mother. She instructs her son, the king, 
on what to look for in a woman who is queen before he marries her. See, a woman must know that she is a king. She is a queen before she becomes somebody's queen. The king's mother is giving him instructions for living a happy life with a wonderful wife. She tells her son what to do and what to look for to avoid and what to stay away from. But in our periphery today, he tells her or she tells him who and what to look for when he's choosing a wife. When a woman handles her business in life, she teaches all women how to be a success, even if you are a non-career woman. No matter what you do, success can be the fruit of your labor. In the African-American context, the black woman has come up against great odds. She has suffered at the hands of uh, slavery, Jim and Jane Crow, oppression, marginalization, rape, abuse, church suppression, ecclesiastical domination, academic tincture handicapping, social deprivation, black market, human trafficking, sexual exploitation, just to name a few. But yet she has overcame, yet she has conquered, yet she has preserved, and yet she has progress. Dr. Carolyn Ann Knight helps us when she said, there has always been a Harriet Tubman to free us, a Sojourner Truth to preach for us, a Rosa Park to sit down for us, and a Coretta Scott to carry us. There has always been great women among our women. In the Old Testament, there was Shifra and Pua to bring forth and to birth. Pua means childbearing or the joy of parents, and Shifra means prolific or to procreate. These women's names added value to who they were. But a mother is not limited to her womb birthing a child. A woman is a mother is any woman who gives birth to hope nurtures potential and breastfeeds possibility. A mother is any woman who carries within her the life that enhances transformation, life that recharts the trajectory of community and life establishing changes is what a mother does. Our encouragement to all women today is never allow your situation and your location to be the basis of your identification nor allow it to place a limitation on your inspiration because your situation and your location are not the sources of your identification yeah. because your identification is in your creation and not in your situation or your location. If you claim your relation to the source of your creation, then there is no situation that can deny or defy your identification, which cannot place a limitation on your inspiration nor stop your continuation to your destination. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet out of a mother. Look closer at the text, if you will, and at first you'll notice her name is not mentioned, which suggests her name doesn't define her, but it identifies who she is. Her name means something, and it is, it is an injustice to the text to suggest that her name is not suggested. Her name is left out because of the weakness of the writers and the wickedness of the producers. In other words, they did not give women names in the Bible because they felt as though that they were beginning too much notoriety, so they suppressed women in the Bible. But it's too many unknown women in the text. And seeing that nobody has named this sister, I want to encourage some woman today to put your name right here in the text. Her name doesn't limit her creativity. It authenticates her genius. Nobody has your DNA. Nobody smiles like you. Nobody nurtures like you. Nobody loves like you. Every woman is different and unique and gifted by God to do something that's going to change somebody else's life. Notice, secondly, her looks are not mentioned, which is to understand her exterior beauty is enhanced by her exterior presence. They don't talk about her looks because when she shows up, there was a song. I know we have a whole lot of saved people in here, but there was a song that uh, when she walked into the room, the men all paused. I know you're a little bit too saved to remember that, but it was a good song because it reminded us that when a woman shows up, her presence ought to change the atmosphere. And then it didn't speak of her, her look because her beauty, her, her life speaks beauty which lasts longer than her looks. You are not going to always be as attractive as we used to be. We're not going to always look as youthful and vibrant, but the beauty of your presence shines and it, it changes uh, the radiance on upon your life. It changes everybody's life you come in contact with. Some mothers didn't have children, but they birthed a whole community for transformation. 
Some mothers didn't have the opportunity to raise a child, but they raised other people's child. They, they raised other people's awareness that grew them in the immature places in their lives. Some, some, some chose not to have. And because they chose not to have, they dedicated their lives to making a difference in other people's lives. And that's just what a mother does. She brings forth and she births possibility. So what happens when a mother handles a business? I promise you I won't be long because I know you're ready to go to brunch or lunch. But let me share this with you. She grants hope to those who emulate her. Her model sets the standard for any woman who desires to live above average. She has confidence in who she is. In other words, she knows herself. It's just amazing that when you watch mothers and grandmothers and godmothers and, and you just become an admirer of the things that they did, it blows your mind that their consistency always produces a blessing. I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this. Listening um, to a mother explain to a father how, how it's not that the mother don't want to get up in the middle of the night to look after the baby. It said, she said, it's just that it's something on the inside of us that when we hear a baby crying, we always are going to run to the needs of that child. Not only does she grant hope to those who emulate her by setting uh, up who, who has confidence, but she is comfortable with working with what she has. Use what you got. I, I'll never forget. I'll never forget looking in the cover one time at Grandmama Willie May, Willie, Willie, uh, uh, Willie Benton, uh, and, and Grandmama said, don't worry about what you don't see. Just trust God that there'll be something on the table at dinner time. <laughs> and Grandmama knew how to go in the back of the yard next to the alley on our side of the fence next to the little garage that looked more like a shack. And Grandmama would, would, would pull some corn and Pull up some collard greens and get some strawberries and get some cucumbers and get some lettuce. And Grandmama could put a meal together even though we didn't see anything on in the cabin or didn't see much in the refrigerator. But when dinner time came, Grandmama had some rice and she had some pork chops and she had some gravy. She had some of them greens. She had some fried corn with a few of them green peppers in it. She had some, to she had some tomatoes and some cucumbers with a little salad dressing on it. And Grandmama had that Kool-Aid, that's where I got it from, that great Kool-Aid with that lemon slice on the side of that glass. And Grandmama said, whatever you do, before you eat, make sure you give thanks to God because it was God that made it happen between the afternoon and the evening meal. Grandmama taught us how to work with what we had so that we could be better. She is focused on what she does. She starts what she finishes, and then she finishes what she starts. I, I, I like that when I've watched mothers over the years in my life to watch them do some amazing things, and every mother, every woman has that ability to start something and finish it and finish something so she can start something else. We would never be as far as we are now if it were not for mothers loving us and giving us the, the, the encouragement, the empowerment, and well as seeing our potential to start something and get it finished. Not only does she help women to emulate a good standing, but she graces those who lives she embraces. Her household and her servants are blessed by her grace through her personhood. It's right there in the text. If you read it, if you read it, she provides what they need. This sister in the text had some people working with her and working for her, and she took care of everybody else. I don't know about you, but I know there are some mothers in the room as well as online who can testify, Reverend, I've made some sacrifices for a long time. I've made sure my children had before I had. I've made sure my spouse had before I had. I've sacrificed a lot. Dr. Leslie Callahan says it this way. She said that the black church owes the poor African-American woman much respect and love. Because if it were not for the continuations, the nickels, the dimes, the dollars, the five dollars, the twenties, the, the, the tens, the twenties, the fifties, the hundreds, and thousands of dollars that poor African American women have come together to do in bake sales and chicken sales and fish fry sales and sacrifices that they made, the black church would not be here today. 
She protects those who she loves. And she profits them with greater because of her investment. I don't know what it is about a mother being able to protect her children. But I've seen some sisters get stronger than the hawk when you talk about messing with their babies. I, I, I've seen, I've seen sisters I, who, who, who were guarding their children with everything that they had within them. I've seen mothers stand up to gangs and stand up to police brutality and stand up against a whole lot of stuff that have come against their children. Nobody can take the, the place of the respectability that mama or a mother or a woman gives when she stands up for what's right in her life. 